Blessings on the Lord's gift of an extension of your time of grace. A time of grace that has entered into a new year, 2022. We're thankful for the time of grace that the Lord has given to us. And we're here to get the fuel and the power and the motivation and the ability to be able to use that time of grace wisely and faithfully. Let's take a look at the opening hymn this morning, hymn number 46, and uh, let's open up our worship service in this way. Your little ones, dear Lord, are we? Servant of Christ, and with his authority, 
I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all of your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church and all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. by your power and keep us in your tender care. I will confirm my covenant between me and you 
and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very few fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Here ends our first lesson. Our worship continues with the Psalm of the Day. That Psalm is Psalm 148. You'll find it on page 121. As is our custom today, we're going to speak that psalm together. Page 121, Psalm 148. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, the sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord from the earth, lightning and hail, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. We continue with the second lesson, this time from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Here the Apostle explained that the Lord waited for just the right time in the course of human history to fulfill the promise that he made in the Garden of Eden to send his Son, the Head Crusher, who is true God and true man. Jesus lived under the law just like every human being, but he did it perfectly for you and for me. He did this that, we might, that he might redeem us from the slavery of sin, from death and from control of the devil. Turn our attention to verses 4 to 7 of Galatians 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Here ends our second lesson. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Hallelujah.
is the forerunner of the promised Messiah. The Lord had indeed remembered his holy covenant in sending a Savior. We turn our attention to Luke chapter 1, beginning of verse 8. Let's arise out of reverence for this third lesson. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy to our fathers and remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Here ends our gospel lesson.
is the epistle from the Soul Selections Periphery. with some added verses. And this one is from Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. These are those words. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. And before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. That's fine. In the name of and to the glory of the God of free, and I'm going to stress and emphasize today, faithful grace, which tells us that it's always there. He's a God who doesn't change, ever. He's always the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And boy, are we glad that that's the case. Dear fellow saints, Why? Why did you come this morning earlier and come to Bible class joyfully desiring to study God's Word, to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And those of you who couldn't come to Bible class, you came joyfully to teach God's Word to our children in Sunday school. Our children came eager and desirous to learn one more lesson in Bible history of our Lord God. And now, why are you here? Why are we gathered here to worship and adore and praise our Savior God? Another hour we're going to spend. Why did we do that? Some people might simply answer by saying, we're believers. And that is what believers do. But I would have to argue that that is a rather simple answer. In fact, I think it would probably get into the idea of simplism. If you ever heard that word, it's not a place to go. Yes? Whatever the answer it is, it's not the best answer. I told you that when we began the soul pericope selections on the first Sunday night, that you were going to hear some selections as sermon meditations that you probably wouldn't normally expect as sermon meditations on Sunday morning. And I think that that's the case with today's selection here from Romans chapter 9. I, I don't think that you intended to hear from this particular section of Romans on the second Sunday after Christmas. Probably more likely one of the readings that we have here. But those aren't from the soul selection curriculum. Whatever the case, we got Romans 9 before us this morning. We had the privilege of being able to hear about the mystery of godliness last week on the day that we celebrated the, the mystery and the miracle of Christ's incarnation. That was on Christmas morning, wasn't it? And today, you and I are going to hear about another <coughs> mystery and another miracle that you and I are familiar with when we use the term, the biblical doctrine of election. As you and I go through Paul's, Paul's letter to the Romans in Romans chapter 9, I'm going to ask that you don't get frustrated if I can't explain it to you adequately or, or to your satisfaction. I, I don't want you to get frustrated if, if you can't understand this, this mysterious doctrine of election, which is also a miracle as well. All I'm simply asking is, is that you and I believe what the Word of God says. And as you and I believe it, let's appreciate in awe 
and with gratefulness. And remember those words. Appreciate in awe and with gratefulness what this doctrine means for us as to who we are and what we do. Romans chapter 9. Actually, the topic that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 9 goes on into Romans chapter 10 and Romans chapter 11. But we're in the beginning of Romans chapter 9. And here Paul is talking to the Jews and telling them why the natural children of Abraham, they aren't all true Israelites. It's because the Lord reckoned Isaac as the son of promise and not the other son of Abraham by the name of Ishmael. And Paul knew what was coming when this topic came up in the beginning of Romans chapter 9. That's the reason why this proceeds in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Paul, Paul wanted to head off what some might wrongly conclude is the way or the reason why God chose the, the person Isaac and not Ishmael. Paul didn't want anybody to assume that there was any merit in the life of these two, these two boys as the reason why God chose one and not the other. Paul went on to explain the, the idea that you and I call the decision of election by pointing out what happened with two other boys. Two other boys that were all that were twins. How about two other twins by the name of Jacob and Esau? This is this is what I'm talking about. These are the words before us this morning. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one of the same father, or father Isaac, yet before twins were born or had done anything good or bad, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Just, just uh, as an uh, interjection here, I'm not going to say anything about that last phrase. I was going to drop it just so that it wouldn't even come up. Um, the idea of the love-hate issue, law and gospel issue, is uh, conversation and discussion that needs to be done not here. We don't have the time to go through that. It would probably be better done in a Bible class talking about that. So I'm not even going to make a comment on that particular part of this verse. We're going to simply go on to the point that, that I'm trying to make this morning. And what Paul is trying to make is, uh, when we're talking about Jacob and Esau, uh, the choosing of the one and uh, not the other. The Lord made it ultra clear why he chose the, the younger son, Jacob, for the special honor of the birthright as well as to become the ancestor of the Messiah and not the older one, Esau. First of all, he didn't want anybody to, to think that it was because of anything in here in either one of them. It had nothing to do with either Jacob or, or Esau. The Lord made his choice as to choose Jacob over Esau long before they were even born. The Lord simply chose Jacob as his son of promise because that's the person he chose. And that really is as simple as the doctrine of election is, is that the Lord has chosen a person simply because he has chosen the person. It doesn't have anything to do with what they have done or what they haven't done. And that is the will of God that is contained in that, that purpose of election. That we hear in verse 12, it says, Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works. Not by anything that they did, but by him who calls. 
again, you and I know that really is a good explanation of the doctrine of election. Not by works, but by him who calls. So what's the problem when it comes to the doctrine of election? The problem is, is that we are human beings who try to understand the understand the not understandable. God's purpose in election. Yes, we try to figure out the reason why God chose Jacob and did not choose Esau. And that is going into a, uh, an area where that's way above our pay grade. Election. The doctrine of teaching. Also known as predestination. It is the teaching that the Lord has, has chosen you and me to be saved. And he did that from the, the confines of eternity, before the creation of the world. And he chose you personally, individually. He knew your name already, before the creation of the world was even around. And he chose you to be saved. And when in time, he carried out that, that, that election to you individually and personally. So that it came to fruition. That really is the doctrine of election. Yes, the Lord has chosen you and me because simply He has chosen you and me. And let it suffice at that and no more. Well, that's not what we want to do as human beings, right? Yes, we want to no more, and the, and the danger is that we start injecting some of our, our, our human wisdom, or at least what we think is wisdom and smartness, and, and, and then we get ourselves into trouble, don't we? Yes. So why are we saved? And you know, I, I shouldn't even ask this question, and why others are not. Again, this is the human part of me that probably has already gone way over than what I should. You and I simply need to, to say that the doctrine of election is the Lord has chosen you and me to believe and to be saved and leave it at that. No, this does not mean that there's a vice versa. And I know that there are denominations out there in the world that have said, well, it just makes sense that the Lord has chosen some to be saved, then he must have chosen some to be also damned or not saved. And, of course, we call that double election. And that is totally going beyond what Scripture says. That is totally bowing down to this, this God that is up in your mind, the idol of your reason. Yeah, it makes sense, but it simply is unscriptural. It is error. Because the Lord makes it very clear. There is, there is not one verse in Scripture that talks or even hints of double election. In fact, God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So, why have we been saved? We still want to ask that question. We want to know why. Just like, just like the child asked the dad. Well, I want to know why you told me to do that. And I'm not going to do that until you tell me why. You've got to give me something to satisfy my curiosity. And we as human beings have the tendency to do that. So why? Why did God choose us? There's got to be a reason. No, they're done. In fact, when you and I try to resolve the seeming paradox that is seemingly present in the doctrine of election and in our minds as human beings, the only way that you and I can resolve that seeming conflict, that seeming paradox, is in none other than the cross of Christ. When all mankind really should have been damned and destroyed forever. Nobody should be saved. The Lord planned a rescue, a remedy. And you and I know that that is found in the cross. That's, the cross is where hatred for every sin and every sinner was resolved once and for all by His Son. The cross is where divine justice that was demanded for all sin and every sinner was satisfied and made by Jesus. Jesus suffered the punishment of hell for every person so that there would be no person who would ever have to be damned for their sin. 
Jesus removed the reason for God's hatred for every sinner when he reconciled all mankind to his heavenly Father by, his, by taking all of our sins upon himself and paying for them. He became that sacrifice of atonement by means of his innocent suffering and death. The result of Jesus' cross work is the blessing of justification for all mankind. That means is that every single person, every man, woman, and child, all mankind, is now in a right relationship with their Lord and Savior, or is not guilty of sin. When you and I talk about the doctrine of election, you and I are talking about uh, you and I being saved. We know that we have been saved because he elected us and carried that out in time. Obviously, we question why do some believe in Jesus as Savior and what he did, his work of redemption, his work of reconciliation, and then, of course, the, the, the consequential decree of the Heavenly Father based on his resurrection, justification for all people. Why do some believe that? such as us, and then why don't others believe? I think that probably is a little bit of a better question than why are some saved and why are some not. So I'm trying to stay away from that. I'm really, really walking very softly here with, and be careful what I say because you can, you can go beyond what Scripture says so easily when it comes to this doctrine of election. And I really, really, really don't want to go beyond what Scripture says, but I want to say everything that Scripture tells us so that you can believe that as well. Again, why has the Holy Spirit brought you and me to faith? And this is probably a little bit better, why has the Holy Spirit brought others to faith? This is where you and I need to remember this. This is a good quote. It says, the mistaken conclusion Paul wants to head off is the thought that there is some reason to serve the human mind. And you and I are thinking this as to why God does what he does. There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a reason why he chose you and me. In other words, that God's election is in response to what people do or don't do. You know, I've even heard this, and this, this is a, a tragedy and an error as well, when the Lord in eternity looked down the pipe and saw you and me and what we would do I mean, that's error. That's basing it on what you did or didn't do. That's word righteousness again. That is an error in the doctrine of election too. Paul debunks that notion and all of the notions that we have anything to do with God's choice at all. The Lord simply cho chose you and me to believe and be saved. He chose us in eternity, individually and personally, and carry out that will in time to you individually and personally. The real question that really every single one of us needs to ask, rather than why some and why, uh, why not others, and you and I are asking that as human beings, I'm saying it's right or correct, but really the question that you and I should have, why in the world did he save any of us? That really is a question that, that I have and we should be thinking here. Why did he choose anybody to be saved in the first place? A good question. Listen to this summary. Not by works, but by him who calls. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. You and I recognize that it is pure, unadulterated mercy, amazing grace, we call it, as the reason why the Lord has chosen you and me to be believers and to be saved. Pure, unadulterated grace. Out of all the people in the world, He has chosen you and me. What a privilege. Yes, what an honor. And remember, it doesn't mean that you're it has anything to do with you. We recall, it does not therefore depend on man's effort, but on God's mercy. 
This statement forces us to wrestle with some very weighty concepts such as mercy and grace. I'm saved by grace. We say it easily, it rolls off our lips, but stop and think what this really means. I did absolutely nothing to qualify for being saved. I was as bad as the next person. God did it all. It was a pure gift. And so you and I conclude, and this is not what we want, and I'm sorry, that's what we're gonna, it's gonna have to suffice, is that the Lord has chosen you and me to believe and be saved, because simply he chose you and me to believe and be saved. Simply the way it is. The Lord chose us because he chose us by grace. It has nothing to do with you or me. Not by works, but by him who calls. That really is the answer to the doctrine or the teaching of election. Not by works, but by him who calls. And anything else, like I said before, it remains above our pay grade. Right it's not a need for us to know. But there are some things that you and I do know. You and I know that we as believers who have been elected to believe and to be saved, that every single one of us love, love to come to Bible class and learn to grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what believers do. That's what believers love to do. Believers love to teach kids in their Sunday school classes. Sunday school kids love to come and hear about Bible class. That's what that's what we love to do. We love to come here and adore and worship our Lord and Savior. Yes, even in the special festivals during the week. Fridays and Saturdays, Wednesdays, big week of the Lent. We love to adore and worship our Savior. We love to do that. We love to serve our Lord and Savior because He first served us. We love to do these things because we are moved. We are in awe by the honor. We are floored by gratefulness. Yes, this is what motivates you and me, what compels you and me to love to do these things as believers. And so there's a little bit more than just this is what believers do. Yes, believers are motivated and compelled by what their Lord has done for them. And one of the things that the Lord has done for them is not just love them, but elected them from eternity and then carried out that election in time. What I hope and pray is that, like the mystery of godliness that we heard about on Christmas morning, as we celebrated the mystery and the miracle of Christ's birth, that you and I will also appreciate the knowledge of the doctrine of the mystery of election as well. But, like I said before, if you and I study this doctrine, for a thousand classes in Bible class, we will never ever get to the point where you and I can understand it satisfactorily or even uh, explain it uh, like, like we would want to. Yes, what do we do as Lutheran Christians? Even though we can't explain it, even though we can't fully really understand it, we believe it completely, don't we? We believe the doctrine of election and we believe his teaching. We believe that the Lord has elected me and you from eternity, personally and legally, before the world began. And that he's carrying out that will to save me and you in time. May the same thing be done by us. As the Apostle Paul advocated to the Ephesian congregation in chapter 1 of Ephesians, he said this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What are those blessings? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Be holy and blameless in his sight. In, son, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So yes, may, may we, every single one of us be glad now and emphasize in awe and with gratefulness praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for he chose us. Amen. Let's arise and confess our faith in the words of the Lord.
for the prayer of the church on this second Sunday of Christmas. I'm going to be using the prayer of the church from the Lutheran liturgy book that goes way back. So it's an archaic prayer, just as I did on, um, on New Year's Eve. So uh, forgive me for the uh, King James type of language, if it does speak through. Um, but let's pray for the prayer for this brand new year. O Almighty God, who art from everlasting to everlasting and unchangeable in your gracious dealings with the children of men, our Maker, Preserver, and most bountiful benefactor, we bring you blessing and worship and praise on this first, second morning of the year. You have, during the past year, upheld us with your everlasting arms, crowning each of our lives with innumerable blessings granting us peace and health and daily bread, protecting our homes and our bodies and souls from every evil, and continuing to us the possession of your holy word. O oh Lord, we are not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown to your servants. And if you should now enter into judgment with us, we would not be able to stand. But you are merciful and gracious, and you've been pleased to blot out all of our transgressions from your remembrance for your name's sake. We praise you for the gift of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our only Redeemer, and we take refuge in the merits of him who take away all of our sins in the world. We give you thanks also for sparing us from year to year and for having given us further time for change through trials. Mercifully grant that with this brand new year, 
we may begin a new life in Christ. Deliver us not only from the guilt of sin, but also from its power and dominion. Govern us by your gracious spirit, and quicken us in the way of righteousness, that we may set out afresh in our Christian course. Give us a new sense of the rapid flight of time, the certainty of death, and the judgment that's coming. Help us to bear in mind that we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, and direct our desires to the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. May we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. Give us grace to watch and pray, that as, be, that as become a Christian, we may praise you with holiness of living, and be always ready for your coming. Heavenly Father, take us and the whole human family under the wings of your gracious protection for this new year of our earthly pilgrimage. Let us experience the continuous and renewal of all your mercies, grant peace to our land, help to our bodies, joy to our souls. Pour down the choice, choicest blessings on all men according to their various wants, and teach them to use the world without abusing it, saying that the fashion of it passes away. Prepare us for all the duties, trials, and afflictions of the new year. Comfort us in every distress. Enable us to work with all of our might well in this day, before the night comes, when no man can work. And should this year be our last on earth, grant that we may depart hence with triumphant faith and enter in the mansions of eternal rest and peace. We pray this for Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but hold us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're at the top of our worship agenda, page 33. The Lord be with you. your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. From the time of fully come, he sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Now they have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the land, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Peace of the Lord be with you all. Oh.